What's going on Legionnaires and welcome back to Comic Breakdown. If you're new to the channel, do me a favor and hit that sub button, hit that notification bell, and make sure you're not missing any of the content that we have coming out. Now I hope everybody had the opportunity to go out and see the Zack Snyder's Justice League if they, ha if they wanted to see it and had the opportunity to because it really is a good movie. I have a review for it, you guys can check out that video. But in this video, we're going to be covering Black Knight... Curse of the Ebony Blade, issue number one. Now, this is written by Simon Spurrier. Art is by Sergio Davila. And cover is by Ivan Coleo. Now, we saw a little bit of the Black Knight in the whole King in Black line. And for the Black Knight, that, that has essentially ended. That's past. So, whatever happened with Noel is, is no longer. But what happened during the King in Black is the Black Knight learned... That the, the sword isn't cursed. All that evil, all that hatred and anger, it's derived from Dane. Now, obviously, nobody else is really tracking this right now. Nobody else is up to date on exactly how the sword isn't the, the instrument of all this bloodlust that he has. And with that being said, let's dive into this breakdown. Now, this issue picks us up with Dane talking to talking to a AI, essentially. And it's a listening program that really just listens to all of your problems. It doesn't really offer any kind of advice, but it's there for when people need to talk. And that's exactly what we see the Black Knight doing, talking about really his self-esteem issues. And he starts the story off by letting us know that he really wants to, to ditch all of his anxieties, his, his regrets, his grudges. At times, he feels like these are like bubbling blisters, and he just needs to get rid of them. Now, while this dialogue is going on, we see our Avengers, we see Black Panther, we see Thor, Captain America, Captain Marvel, all fighting some kind of hideous monsters in Central Park. And as they're dismantling all of these monsters, they see them slowly but surely reassembling themselves. So all of their hacking, all of their dismemberment of these creatures is all for naught. And this is when our Avengers turn around and see none other than the Black Knight riding in on his steed. And so it seems to be more of a running joke with Marvel when it comes to the Black Knight. Because everybody, as upon his arrival, they're just like, oh this guy and even captain america just like uh like thanks thanks for coming like i really appreciate you being here like thank you so much but it, it's it's almost reluctant in in the way that they say it and so everybody sees the black knight as a joke and so as this battle rages on thor can hear black knight talking in his old timey authorian type dialogue and Thor almost and accidentally assumes that he's making fun of him. Because why, why would Thor not think that someone is making fun of him when he's talking in almost a, a ancient type dialect? And Captain America tells Thor, like, try to be nice, man. Like, just try. Like, we know, like, he's an... He's annoying. Like, he doesn't say annoying, but Thor says annoying. Captain Marvel says he's kind of sad. Captain America, his, his, his word for it is eccentric. And I think that's the nicest way that Captain America can say annoying. Or at least would allow himself to. And as they're sitting here on the battlefield, the Black Knight sword gets displaced from him. And Thor goes to try to pick it up, realizing that he can't. And as he sits there and struggles, the Black Knight reaches for his sword, and the sword comes to him in an instant. And it absolutely confuses Thor. He's just like, why? Why could I not lift your sword? And the Black Knight tells him, because it lightens only in shadow. But this story is really about the Black Knight's struggle. He is struggling so hard with the ideas that he is a bad person, that he... He eases to anger in such a quick way, to sadness, to depression. These things constantly live in him, but these are also the source of a lot of his power. Because the angrier he gets in battle, the more bloodlust he becomes. And this all helps drive him. And as we see this battle progress forward, the Black Knight takes the Ebony Blade and uses its power, blasting through some of these monster creatures, whatever you want to call them. And stepping back, looking at the battlefield, we see the Black Knight and his Ebony Blade really taking on all of these monsters by himself. And everybody else is kind of standing by, just watching as he literally demolishes all of these beasts. 
Now this whole story has been cutting back and forth between the battle and him talking to the AI self-help computer program. And he is just struggling so hard with everything. You know, he, he wants to be focusing on happiness, on, on positivity, on his mental health. But he just feels himself going deeper and deeper into the darkness. And that if he were to stop, he wouldn't really feel like himself. And so he questions, where does this end? How does this end? And this is where he arranges to talk to an academic. Someone that's familiar with King Arthur and all the mythology and, and legend that surrounds it. Because his logic here is, you know, something maybe within the mythology could possibly help him out. And this is when we see this academic arriving to the castle, and this academic's name is Jax. Now, upon her arrival to the castle, the Black Knight was called out. This is when the Avengers hit him up, letting him know that they needed his help in Central Park. And of course, you know, being super excited that they called him, he's just like, I, I gotta go, I gotta go right now, like, they need me. They need me so badly. And this is part of his narcissism. And then we cut back over to the battle, and they're just chopping away at these things as they continuously reform themselves. And finally, they're like, hey, you know, Black Knight, we, we called you here for a reason. You're our weapon of mass destruction. Uh, your gift, your ability... We need you to use it. And Black Knight's actually kind of disappointed here. He's like, oh man, like, I really thought you guys just kind of wanted to hang out with me. I thought that's what we were doing here. I thought we were just hanging out, killing bad guys. So reluctantly, as the monster starts to surround him, he uses his gift. And we see electricity and fire go out in all directions. And we see a giant explosion. We see the true power of the Black Knight. And as the dust clears, we see all of our heroes looking at this just like, what the... Like, wow. He really just did that. And we didn't even have to do anything. We, we were literally sitting back just watching all of this transpire. But this is when a shadow figure comes up and whispers into the ear of each of our heroes. And we see Thor. We see Black Panther, Captain America, Captain Marvel all drop to their knees. Essentially incapacitated. And then this thing comes to the Black Knight and tries to whisper in his ear. Telling him that his love had died alone. And with her last breath... She regretted the day she met the Black Knight. And at first, it affects him. But then he brushes it off very quickly. And he looks to this ghost and he tells it. So like, you know the, you know the one thing to say that it'll break somebody's heart. That's your random superpower is triggering people. It's like, I've had plenty of practice torturing myself. You barely even scratched the surface. And this individual tells the Black Knight that he has a myth that he wants to test. And he had hoped that it was going to go about softly, but he's going to do it the hard way now. And this is when he throws a dagger, and it literally chops the head off of the Black Knight. And so the Black Knight lays there, decapitated, and this shadow figure tries to take the sword from the Black Knight. But it fails in its task. It's not able to take the sword. Even in death, the Black Knight holds on to this sword. And this is when the Avengers come into action and this thing really just dissipates in front of them and disappears. Now, picking back up at the Black Knight Castle, we have the Black Knight's butler escorting this academic around the castle and she's looking around investigating everything and this is when he tells her that it's time for her to leave because the Black Knight is, is more or less indisposed. And this is where they come into a room only to see the Black Knight on a slab, dead. But before she leaves, she really wants to touch the ebony blade. She wants to figure out a little bit of history behind it on exactly what it is because she knows that it's 15th century. And as she sits here and struggles with the butler, she gets her hand on it. And this is where she gets a, a vision from Merlin. And she's seeing Camelot. She's seeing the knights of old. She's seeing all kinds of different visions here. But really, she's seeing the land of of Camelot and this is where we see her sit up seemingly to have a headache not really understanding what just happened but then we see the ebony blade having blood pour out of it and it looks like it goes into the Black Knight and this is where we see the Black Knight step up off the table and tell this academic tell Jax that he has some questions 
All right, guys, so as we dive into this issue, we're seeing an individual, an individual who is killing professors at many different college institutes around the world, from Cambridge to Harvard, from Switzerland to London. This individual who we've seen before, we've seen him because he's the guy who ended up killing the Black Knight in the last issue. Now, he seems to be searching for something, but we don't know what it is. And then we're taken over to the castle. We're taken to the home of the Black Knight. Now, the Black Knight, now resurrected, is sitting down w with Jackie at the table, and they're eating, and, and really, it seems like e everybody is just going to ignore the elephant in the room. We're going to ignore the fact that the Black Knight just came back to life. But instead of answering any of the questions here, he simply asks, how is the soup? Now, Jackie, or, or what she likes to go by is Jax. You know, she came here, she really came here for the truth. To test her thesis that Camelot never existed. But as this, as they have some dialogue go along, as this discussion really starts to go more in depth, we see a Black Knight starting to, starting to kind of lose it, starting to break, and then he just snaps. He grabs the table and he flips it. And Jack's response is just, please don't eat my brains, please don't eat my brains, please don't eat my brains. And he's just like, what? <laughs> he's like, I'm not a freaking zombie. And her response is like, how do you know? Like, we, we don't know what you are, you just came back to life. And he's like, alright, that, that's, a, that's a fair point. We gotta go speak to an expert about this. Now, Jack, she's, she's nearly a full-fledged doctor of mythology. And she can, she can tell him by this that the Theatorian cycle is packed with implausible supernatural things. But before she can even finish, she, he's like, you know, we need to go talk to a real expert, not you. And this is where he tells her, you know, I think it's time for you to leave. And before she goes to tell him exactly what she saw when she saw Camelot in full-fledged, thriving society, she says it doesn't matter and she flees. Now the Black Knight, he's in no rush to tell the world he's still alive. You know, a little time out might do him some good. Though he's looking at it from an aspect where it'll have people kind of missing him. And this really is just hitting on his personality of being needy and so on and so forth. And so this is where he gets some help from an old friend. A mentor, if you will. And this is when he calls out Percy. And he lets Percy know, you know, he spent his whole freaking super career not knowing what's up with the Ebony Blade. You know, he, he's tired and depressed, and now apparently he, he's a freaking undead too. And this is when Percy lets him know, or asks the question, if the Blade has shared its gift of resurrection with him. But the thing is, Percy, you know, he only has so much expertise in, in the realm of immortality and knowing exactly what this all means. Now, this is when we're taken outside of a professor's office. Jack's professor, to be exact. Now, she came here immediately after being at the Black Knight's castle because she doesn't know what the heck she even saw and wanted somebody to talk to about it. But what she doesn't know is on the other side of this door, the professor is dead. And standing over the body is somebody in a motorcycle outfit holding on to some kind of medallion that is glowing red. Now, she came here to apologize to her professor because there's graffiti all over the office. And it seems that she is the one that put the graffiti there. But she also wanted him to know that, that she came to talk about Dane Whiteman. Or Whitman, because she had this this dream or something of that nature that left her doubting her own thesis, and she doesn't really know what to believe anymore. And this is when she me mentions enchanted weapons and blood magic, and the person in the motorcycle suit immediately stops, stops dead in their tracks, and hears blood magic, and it gets them thinking. Now this is when Jax opens up the door, only to find the professor is dead, and the window is open. And there's nobody in the room. And she runs over and touches the professor. And in that moment that she touches the professor, she's flashed back. She flashes back to Camelot. And this is where she's met with the familiar. And so what she's looking to be is, is really, we, we're seeing her become a seer. And what she's witnessing is Percy forging a weapon with Merlin standing close by. And in the same instance, we have Percy in the future telling the Black Knight kind of the history behind the sword. And this takes us to the High Age of Camelot and the Court of the Pendragon. No, no may words may compass it. It feels now more like a dream to him than a domain. And perhaps that's, that's by design. A city rich with marvels, a castle as like to have been, to have been grown as built, with its roots deep 
and born on celestial engines. Now, Arthur fell custody of its light, of Merlin's power, and to his side were drawn all the, the prodigies of the Shadowed Era. For Camelot welcomed could only be attained by those who sought its valor's sake. To have their names sung of, of glorious uncounted. And this is when Merlin came to Percy. A cave he was led to. To a secret spur of the dreaded river. The river of the blood of the dead. Carrying from one world to the next. There Merlin stole a spark from Calburus itself. They shattered a rock. The star stone. And with that four items were forged. A sword. A shield. A chalice. And a staff. And Merlin told him to choose one. And of course, Percy immediately chooses the sword. And the remaining treasures were consigned to the tides of hell and carried into to eternal darkness. Now, Percy had believed the river spur was destroyed. Now, picking up this sword, after he served for, for quite some time, he ended up coming against a battle that was the odds were just not in his favor and he was going to lose. But this is where he learned that he had the power of resurrection. That as long as he had Arthurian blood inside of his body, whoever wielded the sword would rise again. And so kind of recapping everything that we just talked about, more or less it's a superpower sword that gets stronger the gloomier or grouchier the wielder is. And also brings back to life anyone who holds it as long as their blood is of Arthur's strain. Meaning of the same family. Which means Percy is essentially his cousin. He's a descendant of him. And that leads us to the, to the next question. Then why is Percy dead? Now before they can even finish this conversation. The, the individual that was on her motorcycle comes blaring through the window. And the Black Knight draws his sword out. And this individual comes in just guns blazing. And also lets the Black Knight know, you know, someone's been killing historians. A dozen just in this month. And using a bloodstone to perform the black magic. Now, this, this motorcyclist, they want that stone. And now they hear some blood-related unpleasantness here as well. And this is when our mo motorcyclist removes her helmet only to reveal that it's Elsa Bloodstone. And the Black Knight, you know, he's, he's trying to to stop her from killing Philip. It's like, listen, like, you're, you're uh, uh, Avengers adjacent, right? So am I. Like, let's talk this out. Now, she's not in any kind of mood to be talking to anybody, and so they're about to get into it. She shoots around at him, he deflects it with the sword, comes up, and cuts her gun in half, and he's about to get real. He's about to turn into the Black Knight. We can see his suit forming around him, manifesting, but this is when it's all broken up. It's broken up by Jax. And she lets him know, like, look, I, I don't know who exactly is doing these murders, but I think I know what they want, because she can feel his need. And to her, it kind of sounds mad, but at the same time, she's talking to a ghost and a, a shoe unit and a bloody Darth Vader cosplayer. So madness is really just relative. And this is where she kind of fills in the gaps for everybody and lets them know that the killer, the killer is trying to re retrieve all of the ebony items. Because all of the other treasures, they weren't actually destroyed. Two got washed away into the river and one got nicked right out of thin air. She saw it with her own eyes. And they all saw the footage of the guy who ended up killing the Black Knight. He was trying to take the sword. And he looked desperate for it. You know, he's trying to get back what was lost. Now, Percy had always assumed that the Ebony Staff may have been stolen by a traitor, but they never had any evidence to prove this. And it must have been reforged into the dagger. The dagger that ended up killing the Black Knight. And so their thoughts are, it must be him. And they were praying that it wasn't. But who else could it be that would be collecting all of these things who would be trying to take down the black knight who other than mordred because it's always freaking mordred we see elsa bloodstone we see the black knight and we have this historian that goes by the name of Jax. now right now they're following the ebony blade because all of the ebony items they're connected in one way or another and currently mordred he has the shield and dagger the Black Knight having the sword, and the only thing missing is the chalice. But this sword, with its magic, is guiding him to the location of the chalice, and they're making their way along the river. The River of Ekron. 
Now, the reason Elsa Bloodstone is even here is because she wants to perform a necromantic blood rite to resurrect a beast slayer from the dawn of time, or also known as her father. And it's not necessarily that she cares about him, it's more that she... She wants to find her inheritance that's been hidden away from her. But this is when something happens. This is when the Ebony Blade just starts blasting off with magic. And so they're getting closer and closer. And as they're getting closer, the Black Knight, he asks Jax, like, I want you, I want to pay you to be my personal historian. The personal historian of the Black Knight. And even she, even Jax is like, why would you want that? Like... I don't understand. Like, you wanna- you want someone to- to write down your history. She just sees it as very egotistical, but as they're in the midst of this conversation, they see the ruins of Camelot. And amongst the ruins, they see the Holy Grail. They see the chalice that they've come looking for. But something is wrong about this place. You know, at one time, this is where the Holy Grail was kept. But it was never in such turmoil like this. It was never in such destruction. But before they can dive too deep into exactly what's going on here, this is when we see Mordred wielding the dagger and the shield. And from a portal behind him comes Redcap. And without missing even a single beat, this fight is underway. With Elsa taking on Redcap and the Black Knight going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mordred. Now this battle is going as well as you would expect it to be going, and it seems that all parties are holding their ground as it stands. But off to the side, this is where we see Jax keeping, keeping her head down, and then she gets approached by a crow. Now this is the same crow that she's been seeing every time that she's accidentally transported somehow to Camelot, where she's witnessed and sees, she's kind of like a seer, where she sees the past. She sees everything that happened. Kind of like uh, Brandon in Game of Thrones. Now the crow, he wants to show her something. Show her what the truth really is. The truth behind the Black Knight. The truth behind the ebony items. What really gives it all power. Where it all comes from. And so with that, they are transported to the past. And in the past, we see the Black Knight standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with none other than the mighty Thor himself. Now Thor, he's demanding entrance into Camelot because he says that there is evil here and it needs to be vanquished. And the Black Knight lets Thor know, like, you're not getting in here, dude. Like, this is my place. King Arthur is not currently here. All the courts are gone. I am left here to guard the castle and no one shall pass by me. Now Thor's men, they try to reason with the Black Knight and tell him, you know, no evil is going to escape us and no one actually has to die today. We don't have to spill blood. But the Black Knight tells him, you know, there's going to be one individual that is going to spill blood. And Thor takes this as a challenge and this is where he prepares for some one-on-one -on -one combat. Now picking up a, with our battle for the chalice, we see that the Black Knight, he's getting mad, he's getting furious. His eyes are filling with red lightning. And in the midst of their battle, in the midst of everybody fighting, this is when we see some kind of ghosts making their way over to them. Now this isn't Mordred and this isn't the Black Knight. They have no idea what this is, but it's people they love, people they admire, people they respect coming up to them and telling them that they're worthy, telling them that they're good enough, telling them that all of their doubts about themselves, they shouldn't be. And while these two are looking all of, at all of these ghosts, we have Elsa and Redcap, and they're just watching this like, uh, like, what do we do here? Like, what do we, this is really weird, guys. Like, what should we do? And they're just like, all right, well, now that that's over, like, let's get back in, like, we've seen enough of that. Let's get back into our fight. And this is when we're taken back to the Black Knight and Thor. They are dueling it out. Now, Thor, he never doubted himself for a second in this fight. He never thought for even a second that he would be defeated. You know, all of the Northmen, they have seen Thor fight battle after battle. He is their Thunderer, their Iron Tempest. In him, they have complete and total faith. But Thor, being in, in his youth, being arrogant, being full of himself, he had no understanding of the blade that he was up against. And he also toyed with him. He toyed with the Black Knight and didn't end it quickly. Thor could have easily won this fight, but his ego got in the way. And in doing so, as they sat here and fought, he taunted the Black Knight, telling him how he's not good enough, telling him how he's not worthy to fight Thor, telling him 
how he is the worst of the worst and Arthur left him behind simply because of that fact. But Thor, he didn't understand, left unsuspected that every single word he was speaking was helping his enemy. It was powering the Black Knight. Every nerve that Thor struck, it only gave the Black Knight more power. And with that, we see the Black Knight, he powers up. And he knocks Thor the heck out. Done in an instant. And the fight, it should have ended there. This should have been the end of it, and it should have been him walking away. But that that anger, that bloodlust that's inside the, the, the Black Knight, it let the Berserker out in him. And he laid waste to every single Northman that had come that day. And because this was such a bloody massacre, because they knew, Merlin knew, that Thor would come seeking vengeance for what happened here today, Merlin sent the crow to remove the memories from Thor's mind. So when Thor woke the next day, he would have no recollection of anything that transpired. And this is where Jax, she finally understands. She understands that the power from the Ebony Blade, it's derived from its bearer, the individual that holds it. The more anger, the more turmoil, the more, the more they question themselves, the more they lack self-confidence, the more depressed, the more angry. This makes them stronger. This makes them, this makes them almost godly. Able to beat Thor, even if Thor was, was being at his, his most arrogant and, and being at his most sloppy. Now Jax, done seeing everything that she's seen on the battlefield, we see the Black Knight and he has somebody whispering it to him. The sh the, it's the shadow or the, the spirit of Jax telling him that he's good enough, telling him that he can let go of the Ebony Blade. Because if he were to let go of this blade, that's when Mordred could strike. If Mordred were to strike after he drops the Ebony Blade, the Black Knight would not return. It could not grant him the immortality. He has to be holding the blade when he dies. Now it really looks like he's about to drop it. And Elsa Bloodstone, she has a decision to make. She could sit here and use her last bullet to kill Redcap, or she could try to save the Black Knight. And at first, she, she really questions it. She's not sure what she's going to do, but she ends up deciding to help the Black Knight. She helps him out by literally blowing his freaking head off. Now, she did this so that he wouldn't drop his weapon. He would die with the weapon in his hand, and now he's going to be able to come back. He's going to come back stronger and not only stronger, he's going to come back faster than he did last time. Because every time you die holding this blade, and every time you come back to life, it's easier than the first time. It's easier than the time before. And it gets to the point where he can essentially reconstruct himself instantaneously. But he hasn't reached that point yet. And so it's going to take a while for, for his body to reconstitute his head. And during this time, we see Jax go running. She goes running looking for the chalice, and running through the ruins, she finds herself upon the chalice, and she picks it up and makes her way out. Now, as this is happening, we see the Black Knight, his head coming back together, all the blood coming back up into a big, big ball, until his face is finally formed again, and all the pieces are put back together. And we see the Black Knight grab onto his ebony blade, and a giant surge of energy comes blasting out in all directions. And now the Black Knight, he's done. Like, he is ready to lay down some hate. And Mordred takes this as his cue. Him and Redcap, they open up a portal, and they get out of there as fast as they possibly can. And so now, the Black Knight has the Ebony Blade and the Chalice, and Mordred has the Shield and the Dagger. The playing field is now even. And Jax tells him that the Chalice, if he were to drink for it, it would give him the gift of understanding. And the Black Knight, he has tons of questions. So many frayed little cords of damage. He knows his pain is what gives him strength, and he dares not seek happiness. Because if he were, he could lose all of his power. And all he can do is hope and the consolation of understanding, because at the end of the day, he needs to know. He needs to fathom his own curse, his own fate. And this knowledge, Mordred believes, is going to be the Black Knight's downfall. Alright guys, so we pick up with the Black Knight, Elsa Bloodstone, and his new partner, Jax. And they have landed on top of this building. And this building doesn't really have any huge significance, but this place is a software development place. 
and when he drank from the chalice, the visions that it showed him and are still showing him, it showed him this place and it showed him that Mordred, he was here. And Jax, she asked what else the chalice is showing him, but he simply says that it's showing him nothing good. And as they make their way into this building, going down the stairwell, they run into Mordred. And as we see these two groups confront one another, this is when the Black Knight starts kind of spazzing out a little bit. Because whatever the chalice is doing to him, it's causing his entire body to freak out. And so with the Black Knight kind of out of commission right now, Elsa Bloodstone, she picks up her rifle and lets Mordred know, you know, the Black Knight, he may not be operational, but I still have this big ass gun and I can still use it. Even if you hide behind that shield, you still have feet that I can shoot. Now Mordred, he tells Redcap to go ahead and open up a portal to the cave. After having him open up this portal, he takes the bloodstone from his head. Taking it from Redcap's head, he disappears into dust. And he tells Elsa that this is the only reason that she is even helping the Black Knight. And if she were to take this stone, they would have no quarrel and she would have no reason to be here. And we see Mordred toss her the stone. Now, at first Jax is like, you know, you're not really going to leave so you can go resurrect a dead family member while we're in the middle of this. But Elsa's like, no, no, I'm, I'm definitely gonna go do this. I'm, I'm leaving right now. Like, family is family. I came for what I needed. Whatever you guys got going on, you can handle this. And so with Elsa walking out of the room, we see, we see the Black Knight attempt to try to battle Mordred. But with the state he is currently in, he can't fight anybody. You know, he tries channeling all of his rage like he normally does. The same things that, that help him fight continuously and get more power, but it's not working. Not this time. Because the chalice, it's showing him so many different things right now. It's showing him visions of the past. Showing him all of the pain, all of the shame, all of this is supposed to strengthen him, to feed him into this blade, but it's not working. But at the end of the day, he got what he wanted. He wanted answers and now he's getting them. He's getting all the answers even if he didn't want them. You know, you put the armor on, the Black Knights, they've, they've put the armor on not really knowing what it means to be the Black Knight, to hold the ebony blade. But now he knows because he has seen everything that the chalice has shown him and the black knight he's a monstrosity he's camelot's dirty little secret the berserker the butcher the hero who defends the light by diving into darkness you know the black knight he definitely did good in the past the first one sir percy but as the years grew on the darkness grabbed hold of him more with every year the collateral grew the mistakes got harder to hide and our black knight he thinks you know it was probably a relief for percy when that assassin blade took his life he could have very easily held on to the ebony blade and he could have came back but he chose death finally a way out of all of this and so with that we have the death of the first black knight and though he did stick around lingering as a spirit thinking maybe that he could cure this he could find a way to cure cure himself from this curse of the blade now we see mordred in the black knight and they are battling it out and right now, the Black Knight, he is super freaking OP. He has all of this power, all this raw power just building up inside of him right now. But Mordred is truly just taunting him, asking him if the chalice has shown him all of the secrets. Has it shown him all of Mordred's secrets yet? And of course, it had already shown him this. What it showed is Mordred. Now, King Arthur, he called Mordred nephew. But the truth of the matter is this is his son. Arthur ended up sleeping with his sister, and that is how Mordred was born. And Mordred, he was treated like complete crap because of this. Because of Arthur having shame for what he did, only keeping him alive because he is his son, but he tells Mordred that he will be the last individual of the Arthur bloodline to ever sit in the throne. He will never, ever be seen anything more than a mistake on the Arthur bloodline. And so this begs the question, was Mordred always evil or was his treatment the cause of his descent into this? Because after this, he conspired in the dark, murdered and manipulated. And it was all because 
of the help with Merlin. Merlin was there backing him from the very get-go, playing like a puppet master, trying to control the fate of Camelot. But the truth of the matter is he came to see that Camelot had more power as an idea, as a story, than a real actual place. A myth can be controlled, rewritten, and purified for all of its mistakes. And so it begs the question, did Mordred conspire with him for the fall of Camelot, or was he just standing by? Regardless, after Camelot fell, Merlin, he went to work, using a great magic to strip away everything that didn't fit into his myth. The familiars and the pagan gods, the woman and the colorful faces, even the memories of a tortured ghost, all completely cleansed, dumped like echoes, where inconvenience fade away. And what was left, what he carried off to other worlds, was nothing more than Merlin's creation. Now at this point, Mordred has gotten the upper hand in this fight, and we see Jax pick up that big ass gun and she points it at Mordred and she fires away. Mordred using the shield to block the shot. We see the Black Knight try to tell her to stop, to, to, to not go any further, to not face off Mordred by herself, that he knows everybody's secrets. And he whispers into her ear and we see her drop down to her knees, able to seep into her mind and use her own biggest fears, her biggest secrets against her causing her to have a kind of a mental breakdown right here on the spot. And Mordred, he asked the Black Knight, he asked him one last thing, has it shown you how all of this ends? And the chalice, it showed him how all of this, it could have stopped before all of it started, if only Sir Percy hadn't had a child. And being of the Arthur bloodline, it was passed down from generation to the generation, from, from next Black Knight to the next, each one trying their best to try to control this curse, this rage that they get when they pick up this sword. And so how does all of this end? It ends the only way it can. And this is where we see the Black Knight take the Ebony Blade and he casts it to the ground. And he says that he refuses. He refuses to be defined by his flaws any longer. And that's exactly what being the Ebony Blade is. It is defined by your flaws, using the worst parts of you as your power. And the Black Knight, he is done with it. He doesn't want any part of it anymore. And he sees all of this and he is just done. Casting the sword to the ground, Mordred takes the opportunity using the Ebony Dagger and he plunges it into the stomach of the Black Knight. And we see the Black Knight bleeding out, crawling away from Mordred. Mordred going and picking up the Ebony Blade. Taking all of these Ebony items, he is going to create something. He is going to forge something. Now Jax is still here, but Mordred really isn't concerned with her. Simply telling her, if you go ahead and try to stand against me, you're gonna regret it. But Jax, being a historian, she really wants to know, like, what are you forging this into? Now he doesn't divulge that information just yet, but he does let us know that he is of a Thorian blood. He is of the Arthur bloodline. Now we found this out because of the chalice, but what's interesting about this is he is he has worked in the shadows for years now, taking out every single every single individual that has Arthur's blood because he needs this blood to be able to cool the ebony weapons. Whatever he is forging, the only thing that can cool its flame is the blood of the Arthur line. And so over the years, he has co he's collected every single individual he can find, making himself the last of the bloodline. And going into the portal, we see him drop whatever he forged and put it upon his head. His father said that he would be the last one of the Arthur line to inherit the throne, and now he truly is the last one, and we see him put on the crown, the ebony crown. Now Jax, she takes this opportunity to try to attack him, picking up a sword against him and swinging it, but we see her literally fall apart. The power of this crown is unmatched, and he tried to tell her, he tried to warn her to stay away, because now nobody can face him, not Merlin, not the Black Knight, definitely not Jax, and using the Ebony Crown, he will forge a new Camelot, he will make it prosper again, he will rule over the land in other worlds, and so rises the Dark Pendragon. As we dive into issue number 5, we are picking up with Mordred, 
currently wearing the ebony crown, but there's a catch because he has mixed magic and technology. Now, throughout this series, Dane has been talking to kind of a, a, a therapist app, if you will. It's called Listener App. And this app is kind of for people to just air out their grievances. More or less, it's a private diary. And so all of their angry thoughts, all of their hatred, their frustration, it's all let out into this. And all of this anger, it feeds Mordred. It gives him more power. And now that the crown has been completed, he has a type of control over these individuals. Not necessarily controlling their actions, but activating their anger to a point that they lose control and we see them start riding in the streets. These mobs, this anger all building up and just feeding him more and more. And Mordred's plan is to build a new Camelot. Build it right here on this existing city. Using the magic that he has, we see buildings starting to transform. But while he's doing this, he hears one listener. And this listener catches his ear because it is Dane. It is the Black Knight, using the app one last time as he slowly dies. And Mordred can't help but laugh at this, believing Dane, you know, use his last minutes to complain to a stupid app that his arch enemy created. And so feeling like he wants to have a laugh, he continues the audio. He listens to this as he transforms the city into Camelot. And while all of this is going on, we see a skeleton hand around the ebony sword. And it appears that flesh is starting to form on it. It appears that somebody is being resurrected. Mordred being too distracted, listening to Dane complain about how all of his life mistakes have led him to this point in time in his life. He doesn't see that Jax has come back to life wielding the ebony blade and she attacks Mordred. Now, at this point, I know a lot of you guys have not only predicted this, but were worried that this might be the, the way the story is going. But I'm saying, let me finish this up. Let's get to the end of the comic. And we'll talk more about Jax in this moment. We'll see how you guys like the ending, and we'll go from there. So with Jax picking up the sword, she attacks Mordred. And as it stands in this moment, she has no idea how she is doing this. Because it is supposed to be someone of Arthur's bloodline. Only someone of his bloodline can wield the sword. And so these two start fighting. Though I wouldn't call it much of a fight because Jax doesn't really know what she's doing. Being able to block and maybe throw some, throw some sword blows here and there. But at the end of the day, Mordred is skilled. He's talented and right now the only reason he is thrown off his guard is because he hears Dane's little, little diary input and is completely distracting him. Trying to get the system to turn it off, but there seems to be some kind of issue. And so Mordred, he tries to end this. Blasting Jax, knocking her back. But he can't help but listen to the voice on the audio. Because that voice is talking to him in this moment. Because Dane knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew how all of this was going to play out. When he drank from the ebony chalice, it showed him all of this. And goes on to tell him that it's important... He understands this very principle before they move forward. He's letting him know that Jax is his daughter. Because while Mordred went out of his way to track down every single male heir, he was too stuck in medieval ways to realize that a woman could inherit the sword. That it didn't necessarily have to be a male heir. And so Dane decided to give her a job. After he found out that this was his child, he has been waiting for the opportunity to, to let her know that he is her father. The thing is, he never knew about her. She had gotten pregnant and kind of disappeared. And then she ended up dying and never telling him about the daughter that he had. But right now, that daughter is about to whoop his butt. And of course, that's not actually the case, because Mordred blasts her with a huge blast of energy. Because at the end of the day, this is freaking Mordred, and she is completely unskilled and untrained in any of this. But luckily for her, this is where we see Elsa Bloodstone make her arrival, throwing the Bloodstone at Mordred and shooting it. But this doesn't kill him, it only slows him down, giving Jax our new Black Knight and Elsa Bloodstone the opportunity to make their attacks. 
And right now, Mordred, he is mad. He is ticked off. And he is about ready to let loose on them. And as he brings down the fires of hell on them, this is when we see Dane. Dane bringing him inward. Bringing him to the wasteland. More or less, this is taking... Taking his subconscious mind, taking his consciousness, and taking it to a plane called the Wasteland. All while his body is sitting up there completely defenseless, unable to do anything. So Dane is distracting him while the two up there are gonna beat the crap out of him. Now the Wasteland, this is where Camelot's dirty little secrets get dumped. This is a place between death and restoration. Kind of like a limbo, if you will. Now at this point, Mordred... He doesn't know what the heck is going on or what he is talking about. Not understanding how how Dane could even have restoration, how he could come back to life. But he tells him because of the listener app, he was connected to the crown in a roundabout way. Even though it wasn't a physical direct connection, he was connected to it. And because of this, as Mordred dies, it brings Dane back to life. We see him come back to life wearing the ebony crown. And as Jax brings down her sword, that is exactly what happens. Mordred dissipates, and from the blinding light, the Black Knight is reborn. And that's what will bring this fight to an end. And it will pick us up one week later. Now, one week later, we pick up with the Black Knight currently working on something. Elsa Bloodstone worried that, that Mordred might come back. The, but the Black Knight, he knows he's going to come back. You know, he's Mordred. He always comes back in one way or another. And right now, Jax, she's kind of processing everything that's going on. She's processing that the Black Knight is her father, that she has the power to become the Black Knight. But all Dane really wants is to be able to communicate. He's not even sure if, if there's going to be a chance for them to have a relationship, but he wants her to know who he is and where he comes from. And this is where we get a glimpse of what he has been working on. He calls it the Ebon Siege. Crafting the ebony items together. This is what the chalice told him he needs to make. Now this shows him things. It takes him places. It can take you to the past. It can take you to other worlds. It can show you truths and lies. It can show you many, many different things. And as he sits upon this chair, this is where we see the arrival of Jax. Storming in here, letting him know that she has made a decision. Now she's not really sure what to do when it comes to, to him being her father. She's not even sure if they could have that kind of family dynamic or relationship or anything like that. But the thing she has made up her mind on, her decision, is on, on being the Black Knight. Because as it stands, no matter the relationship, they are family, and they both are dealing with a lot of pain. And so instead of thrashing around, trying to figure in what to do, if, if they should give in or if they should run away from this, that they should take the third option, a burden that they should share together. One of them wielding the ebony sword and the other seating in the seat. Because at the end of the day, the Black Knight is not a person. The Black Knight is an idea. And so this means that one of them can be sitting in the seat, the other can be out there swinging the sword. And then they can take turns, they can switch places. No one ever has to know the true identity of the Black Knight. And so you have two broken people making up one hero. And that will be the end of this issue. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Alright, so I'm going to start this off by saying I was, I was highly skeptical getting through this comic. Because I was really worried that Jax was just going to be taking over as the Black Knight. And that they were going to kill Dane off. But as I get to the end... As I see what they decided to do and the route they decided to go, I'm not mad at it. I'm actually quite happy that they did it in this way. Because you're giving the opportunity to pass the mantle without killing Dane. You're putting him more in a mentor state, but also allowing him the opportunity to still wield the ebony blade. And we have to admit, this has been a huge burden on Dane. He has been struggling with carrying this for so long. In fact, all the way back, every single Black Knight has struggled with this. And so if sharing that burden may be the answer to all of this, why not actually do it? So to me, this makes a lot of sense. With all that power, with all of that anger, splitting up the burden can only make the job just a little bit easier. Now, we can only speculate up to this point 
on, on why they decided to go this route in creating Jax to begin with. I can only assume that the Black Knight showing up in the Eternals MCU is end up going to end up being a female, and that's probably why they went this direction. But yeah, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. If you have not yet, do me a favor, hit that sub button, hit that notification bell, make sure you're not missing any of the awesome content we have coming out, and until the next breakdown.